I'm Lucia Dolce. I'm a uh, Numata reader in Japanese Buddhism at uh, SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies of University of London. Um, there I'm also chairing uh, uh, two centers, a center for the study of Japanese religions and a center for Buddhist studies. So I'll be talking about my current research uh, that uh, um, deals with conceptions of the body in Japanese Buddhism in the medieval period. In particular, I'm looking at uh, a range of texts. They've been recently found in um, um, archives of medieval Japanese temples um, in various areas of Japan. Um, some of these temples are uh, Shinpokuji in Nagoya, which has a large um, archive called Osu Kannon, Osu Bunko, um, then uh, Ninaji in Kyoto, and uh, uh, Kanazawa Bunko, um, that uh, is a national uh, library today and is uh, um, the archive of uh, Shomyoji, a Shingon temple. And I'm interested in these uh, uh, sources because they uh, present various views of, uh, of the body, of the body of the practitioner mainly and presented these ideas uh, not only in discursive form, but uh, also through visual images, images and diagrams. We are used to, to think of Buddhism as uh, a tradition that um, um, rejects the body uh, because uh, the body is polluting, because the body means attachment. But what we have in the tantric context is a transformation of this room as the ideal place uh, where uh, perfect uh, bodies can be produced. Tantric Buddhism is uh, uh, just a synonym of esoteric Buddhism, um, but what, which is a form of Mahayana Buddhism. What distinguishes uh, uh, Tantric Buddhism from the rest of Mahayana Buddhism is the idea that uh, uh, liberation or Buddhahood can be achieved quickly and in this life. A tantric way, if we can say so, is a quick, immediate way, way to attain liberation. So in uh, Japanese culture, um, this goes with the uh, expression uh, attaining uh, Buddhahood with one's own body, Sokushin Jobutsu. Um, that is, uh, uh, takes the name from a treatise uh, um, by Kukai, or attributed to Kukai, um, that uh, um, think of uh, uh, this ideal status that is uh, Buddhahood as something that can be uh, reached, that can be uh, um, developed within uh, not just one's life, but within the uh, body attained uh, from father and mother, that's how the uh, text expresses itself, or the, the flesh body. This is kind of the mainstream idea of tantric sources. Uh, so what is different in the uh, medieval text? So Kukai is kind of it's what we would call early Buddhism. So we have the theory, in a sense, in Kukai's writings, but we don't have much of the practice. And we don't have a, a very articulated development of these ideas. Whereas what we find in medieval sources are different notions that come together to uh, present a very articulated view of the body. And uh, uh, this view seemed to, uh, seems to draw on uh, uh, basic Indian ideas, uh, probably medical sources, um, uh, medical ideas of the body uh, that uh, were filtered through Buddhist texts, but also Chinese idea, what I call the organic body, so a body that is based on the, on the working of the organs, of the main organs, as a reflection of the working of the cosmic entities. And uh, uh, they bring these two together and uh, um, think of the practice of the esoteric practitioner as a reproduction of the gestation process that produces a human being. What is produced through this ritual gestation is a perfected body of the practitioner that is at the same time the human body, his own body, but is at the same time the 
body of the Buddha or the original body. It is a very curious system that they use. It's a five-step um, embryological growth that uh, uh, divides the gestation period in five periods of seven days probably or seven yeah something that looks like seven days mm -hmm. so in the manuscript there's a kind of uh, uh, working up to the moment of uh, gestation so first presenting these uh, elements as cosmological elements and then there is the the, the this mandala uh, that uh, uh, indicates the coming together of the opposites, and then you have the gestation. Duality is, of course, uh, a very important concept in Buddhism, and the overcoming of duality is an even more important aim for Buddhist practice. But what happens in these texts, I think, is that duality is emphasized, is visualized, and this visualization takes place in a, you could say, symbolic way through the use of pairs of deities, very often pairs of deities that have never been paired before. So they are new kind of couples that were developed uh, by Japanese ritualists in, um, in various uh, uh, settings or by uh, using uh, bio what I call biological opposites, so women and men, um, or also uh, sun and moon. Uh, for that. And there is a continuous reference to conventional uh, orthodox, we could say, um, dual uh, elements such as the dual mandalas of uh, esoteric Buddhism, the room mandala and the adamantine world mandala. So we, we do have uh, various sets of opposites that are presented to the practitioner. And uh, uh, what is interesting for me is that various ways uh, of uh, overcoming this duality are um, indicated by the text. Uh, one striking image that um, I have worked on is uh, a so-called mandala on which two figures of opposite um, beings, uh, possibly a man and a woman, are uh, shown in a sexual uh, intercourse um, with uh, two mirror-like uh, syllables that represent the Buddhas of esoteric Buddhism um, drawn on their uh, genitals. So this is a very good example of uh, a way of representing duality, but also a way of representing the coming together of opposites um, in order to retrieve the original condition of non-differentiation. So we have a, a non-duality which is not absolute, it's a non-duality that incorporates duality in itself. But I think women's body here are absent. That's why I think the reproductive system thinks of women more as a kind of cosmological principle, the opposite of men. Uh, although uh, many of these documents I've looked at do use a figure but female figures uh, as opposite to male figures uh, to um, make clear uh, the presence of a, an op a biological opposite that confronts the practitioners at the moment in which has to ritually uh, undergo this process of gestation. We do not have enough historical uh, documentation of the practice. We know who wrote uh, many of these writings, uh, many of these um, manuscripts. Um, we know that they were transmitted within the lineages. Obviously, we still have the manuscripts, so they were preserved. Um, for instance, I, when I was talking about this uh, uh, manuscript that has the uh, uh, the two characters for, for Dagi in the back, uh, well, that is a very interesting example. It has also the same uh, characters in the outer title, is a scroll, and it has, been put, it, it, it has been found in a box called the Box of Heterodox Writings. So clearly, the fact that uh, um, at a certain point in history, uh, the readers of these manuscripts were not uh, comfortable with 
the content did not mean that they were thrown away. In the medieval period, it seems to me that these ideas were very much part of a mainstream rethinking of what the practice of uh, the tantras tells about human life. The, the entire concept of heterodoxy in Buddhism is, uh, is a big problem now, when there is no uh, central source of, of uh, um, um, of power in the sense, a central source that defines what is the right teaching, then uh, uh, heterodoxy can be expressed also only in political terms, um, in the sense of uh, competition between lineages rather than in terms of doctrinal content.